The Hermit and the Wild Woman. A short story by Edith Wharton. One, the hermit lived in a cave in the hollow of a hill. Below him was a glen with a stream in a coppice of oaks and alders. And on the farther side of the valley, half a day's journey distant, another hill, steep and bristling, which raised aloft a little walled town with gibberline swallowtails notched against the sky. When the hermit was a lad and lived in the town, the crenellations of the walls had been square-topped, and a Guelph lord had flown his standard from the keep. Then one day a steel-coloured line of men-at-arms rode across the valley, wound up the hill and battered in the gates. Stones and Greek fire rained from the ramparts, shields clashed in the streets, blades sprang at blade in passages and stairways, pikes and lances dripped above huddled flesh, and all the still familiar place was a stew of dying bodies. The boy fled from it in horror. He had seen his father go forth and not come back, his mother drop dead from an arquebus shot as she leaned from the platform of the tower, his little sister fall with a slit throat across the altar steps of the chapel, and he ran, ran for his life through the slippery streets, over warm twitching bodies, between legs of soldiers carousing, out of the gates, past burning farmsteads, trampled wheat fields, orchards stripped and broken, till the still woods received him and he fell face down on the unmutilated earth. He had no wish to go back. His longing was to live hidden from life. Up the hillside he found a hollow in the rock and built before it a porch of boughs bound together with withies. He fed on nuts and roots and on trout which he caught with his hands under the stones in the stream. He had always been a quiet boy, liking to sit at his mother's feet and watch the flowers grow on her embroidery frame, while the chaplain read aloud the histories of the Desert Fathers from a great silver-clasped volume. He would rather have been bred a clerk and scholar than a knight's son, and his happiest moments were when he served mass for the chaplain in the early morning and felt his heart flutter up and up like a lark, up and up till it was lost in infinite space and brightness. Almost as happy were the hours when he sat beside the foreign painter who came over the mountains to paint the chapel, and under whose brush celestial faces grew out of the rough wall as if he had sown some magic seed which flowered while you watched it. With the appearing of every gold-rimmed face, the boy felt he had won another friend, a friend who would come and bend above him at night, keeping off the ugly visions which haunted his pillow visions of the gnawing monsters about the church porch, evil-faced bats and dragons, giant worms and winged bristling hogs, a devil's flock who crept down from the stonework at night and hunted the souls of sinful children through the town. With the growth of the picture, the bright-mailed angels thronged so close about the boy's bed that between their interwoven wings, not a snout or a claw could force itself and he would turn over sighing on his pillow, which felt as soft and warm as if it had been lined with down from those sheltering pinions. All these thoughts came back to him now in his cave on the cliffside. The stillness seemed to enclose him with wings, to fold him away from life and evil. He was never restless or discontented. He loved the long, silent, empty days, each one as like the other as pearls in a well-matched string. Above all, he liked to have time to save his soul. He had been greatly troubled about his soul since a band of flagellants had passed through the town, exhibiting their gaunt, scourged bodies and exhorting the people to turn from soft raiment and delicate fare, from marriage and money-getting and dancing and games, and think only how they might escape the devil's talons and the great red blaze of hell. For days that red blaze hung on the edge of the boy's thoughts, like the light of a burning city across a plain. There seemed to be so many pitfalls to avoid. So many things were wicked which one might have supposed to be harmless. How could a child of his age tell? He dared not for a moment think of anything else. And the scene of sack and slaughter from which he had fled gave shape and distinctness to that blood-red vision. Hell was like that. Only a million million times worse. Now he knew how flesh looked when devil's pincers tore it, how the shrieks of the damned sounded, 
and how roasting bodies smelled. How could a Christian spare one moment of his days and nights from the long, long struggle to keep safe from the wrath to come? Gradually the horror faded, leaving only a tranquil pleasure in the minute performance of his religious duties. His mind was not naturally given to the contemplation of evil, and in the blessed solitude of his new life, his thoughts dwelt more and more on the beauty of holiness. His desire was to be perfectly good and to live in love and charity with his fellow men. And how could one do this without fleeing from them? At first, his life was difficult, for in the winter season, he was put to great straits to feed himself. And there were nights when the sky was like an iron vault, and a hoarse wind rattled the oak wood in the valley, and a great fear came on him that was worse than any cold. But in time, it became known to his townsfolk and to the peasants in the neighbouring valleys that he had withdrawn to the wilderness to lead a godly life. And after that, his worst hardships were over, for pious persons brought him gifts of oil and dried fruit. One good woman gave him seeds from her garden, another spun for him a hodden gown, and others would have brought him all manner of food and clothing had he not refused to accept anything but for his bare needs. The good woman who had given him the seeds showed him also how to build a little garden on the southern ledge of his cliff. And all one summer the hermit carried up soil from the stream side, and the next he carried up water to keep his garden green. After that the fear of solitude quite passed from him, for he was so busy all day long that at night he had much ado to fight off the demon of sleep, which St. Arsenius the abbot has denounced as the chief foe of the solitary. His memory kept good store of prayers and litanies, besides long passages from the Mass and other offices, and he marked the hours of his day by different acts of devotion. On Sundays and feast days, when the wind was set his way, he could hear the church bells from his native town, and these helped him to follow the worship of the faithful and to bear in mind the seasons of the liturgical year. And what with carrying up water from the river, digging in the garden, gathering faggots for his fire, observing his religious duties, and keeping his thoughts continually upon the salvation of his soul, the hermit knew not a moment's idleness. At first, during his night vigils, he had felt a great fear of the stars which seemed to set a cruel watch upon him, as though they spied out the frailty of his heart and took the measure of his littleness. But one day a wandering clerk, to whom he chanced to give a night's shelter, explained to him that, in the opinion of the most learned doctors of theology, the stars were inhabited by the spirits of the blessed, and this thought brought great consolation to the hermit. Even on winter nights, when the eagle's wings clanged among the peaks, and he heard the long howl of wolves about the sheepcoats in the valley, he no longer felt any fear, but thought of those sounds as representing the evil voices of the world, and hugged himself in the solitude of his cave. Sometimes, to keep himself awake, he composed lords in honour of Christ and the saints, and they seemed to him so pleasant that he feared to forget them. So after much debate with himself, he decided to ask a friendly priest from the valley, who sometimes visited him, to write down the lords, and the priest wrote them down on comely sheepskin, which the hermit dried and prepared with his own hands. When the hermit saw them written down, they appeared to him so beautiful that he feared to commit the sin of vanity if he looked at them too often. So he hid them between two smooth stones in his cave and vowed that he would take them out only once in the year, at Easter, when our Lord has risen and it is meet that Christians should rejoice. And this vow he faithfully kept. But alas, when Easter drew near, he found he was looking forward to the blessed festival less because of our Lord's rising than because he should then be able to read his pleasant lords written on fair sheepskin. And thereupon he took a vow that he would not look upon the lords till he lay dying. So the hermit for many years lived to the glory of God and in great peace of mind. 2. One day he resolved to set forth on a visit to the saint of the rock, who lived on the other side of the mountains. Travellers had brought the hermit report of this solitary, 
how he lived in great holiness and austerity in a desert place among the hills, where snow lay all winter, and in summer the sun beat down cruelly. The saint, it appeared, had vowed that he would withdraw from the world to a spot where there was neither shade nor water, lest he should be tempted to take his ease and think less continually upon his maker. But wherever he went, he found a spreading tree or a gushing spring, till at last he climbed up to the bare heights where nothing grows, and where the only water comes from the melting of the snow in spring. Here he found a tall rock rising from the ground, and in it he scooped a hollow with his own hands, labouring for five years and wearing his fingers to the bone. Then he seated himself in the hollow, which faced the west, so that in winter he should have small warmth of the sun and in summer be consumed by it. And there he had sat without moving for years beyond number. The hermit was greatly drawn by the tale of such austerities, which in his humility he did not dream of emulating, but desired, for his soul's good, to contemplate and praise. So one day he bound sandals to his feet, cut an older staff from the stream, and set out to visit the saint of the rock. It was the pleasant spring season, when seeds are shooting and the bud is on the tree. The hermit was troubled at the thought of leaving his plants without water, but he could not travel in winter by reason of the snows, and in summer he feared the garden would suffer even more from his absence. So he set out, praying that rain might fall while he was away, and hoping to return again in five days. The peasants labouring in the fields left their work to ask his blessing, and they would even have followed him in great numbers had he not told them that he was bound on a pilgrimage to the Saint of the Rock, and that it behooved him to go alone as one solitary seeking another. So they respected his wish, and he went on and entered the forest. In the forest he walked for two days and slept for two nights. He heard the wolves crying and foxes rustling in the covert, and once, at twilight, a shaggy brown man peered at him through the leaves and galloped away with a soft padding of hooves. But the hermit feared neither wild beasts nor evildoers nor even the fawns and satyrs who linger in unhallowed forest depths where the cross has not been raised. For he said, If I die, I die to the glory of God, and if I live, it must be to the same end. Only he felt a secret pang at the thought that he might die without seeing his lords again. But the third day, without misadventure, he came out on another valley. Then he began to climb the mountain, first through brown woods of beech and oak, then through pine and broom, and then across red stony ledges where only a pinched growth of lentisk and briar spread in patches over the rock. By this time he thought to have reached his goal, but for two more days he fared on through the same scene, with the sky close over him and the green valleys of earth receding far below. Sometimes for hours he saw only the red glistering slopes tufted with thin bushes and the hard blue heaven so close that it seemed his hand could touch it. Then at a turn of the path, the rocks rolled apart, the eye plunged down a long pine-clad defile and beyond it, the forest flowed in mighty undulations to a plain shining with cities and another mountain range many days journey away. To some eyes, this would have been a terrible spectacle, reminding the wayfarer of his remoteness from his kind and of the perils which lurk in waste places and the weakness of man against them. But the hermit was so mated to solitude and felt such love for all things created that to him the bare rocks sang of their maker and the vast distance bore witness to his greatness. So his servant journeyed on unafraid. But one morning... After a long climb over steep and difficult slopes, the wayfarer halted suddenly at a bend of the way, for beyond the defile at his feet there was no plain shining with cities, but a bare expanse of shaken silver that reached away to the rim of the world. And the hermit knew it was the sea. Fear seized him then, for it was terrible to see that great plain move like a heaving bosom, and as he looked on it, the earth seemed also to heave beneath him.
but presently he remembered how Christ had walked the waves, and how even St. Mary of Egypt, who was a great sinner, had crossed the waters of Jordan dryshod to receive the sacrament from the abbot Zosimus. And then the hermit's heart grew still, and he sang as he went down the mountain, The sea shall praise thee, O Lord. All day he kept seeing it and then losing it, but toward night he came to a cleft of the hills and lay down in a pine wood to sleep. He had now been six days gone, and once and again he thought anxiously of his herbs, but he said to himself, What though my garden perish, if I see a holy man face to face and praise God in his company? So he was never long cast down. Before daylight he was afoot under the stars, and leaving the wood where he had slept, began climbing the face of a tall cliff, where he had to clutch the jutting ledges with his hands, and with every step he gained, a rock seemed thrust forth to hurl him back. So, footsore and bleeding, he reached a little stony plain as the sun dropped to the sea, and in the red light he saw a hollow rock and the saint sitting in the hollow. The hermit fell on his knees, praising God. Then he rose and ran across the plain to the rock. As he drew near, he saw that the saint was a very old man, clad in goatskin with a long white beard. He sat motionless, his hands on his knees, and two red eye sockets turned to the sunset. Near him was a young boy in skins who brushed the flies from his face, but they always came back and settled on the room which ran from his eyes. He did not appear to hear or see the approach of the hermit, but sat quite still till the boy said, Father, here is a pilgrim. Then he lifted up his voice and asked angrily who was there and what the stranger sought. The hermit answered, Father, the report of your holy practices came to me a long way off, and being myself a solitary, though not worthy to be named with you for godliness, it seemed fitting that I should cross the mountains to visit you, that we might sit together and speak in praise of solitude. The saint replied, You fool, how can two sit together and praise solitude, since by so doing they put an end to the thing they pretend to honour? The hermit at that was sorely abashed, for he had thought his speech out on the way, reciting it many times over, and now it appeared to him vainer than the crackling of thorns under a pot. Nevertheless, he took heart and said, True, father, but may not two sinners sit together and praise Christ, who has taught them the blessings of solitude? But the other only answered, if you had really learned the blessings of solitude, you would not squander them in idle wandering. And, the hermit not knowing how to reply, he said again, If two sinners meet, they can best praise Christ by going each his own way in silence. After that, he shut his lips and continued motionless, while the boy brushed the flies from his eye sockets. But the hermit's heart sank, and for the first time, he felt all the weariness of the way he had fared and the great distance dividing him from home. He had meant to take counsel with the saint concerning his lords and whether he ought to destroy them, but now he had no heart to say another word, and turning away he began to descend the mountain. Presently he heard steps running behind him, and the boy came up and pressed a honeycomb in his hand. You have come a long way and must be hungry, he said. But before the hermit could thank him, he had hastened back to his task. So the hermit crept down the mountain till he reached the wood where he had slept before, and there he made his bed again. But he had no mind to eat before sleeping, for his heart hungered more than his body, and his salt tears made the honeycomb bitter. Three. On the fourteenth day he came to the valley below his cliff and saw the walls of his native town against the sky. He was footsore and heavy of heart, for his long pilgrimage had brought him only weariness and humiliation, and as no drop of rain had fallen, he knew that his garden must have perished. So he climbed the cliff heavily and reached his cave at the Angelus. But there a great wonder awaited him. For though the scant earth of the hillside was parched and crumbling, 
His garden soil reeked with moisture, and his plants had shot up, fresh and glistening, to a height they had never before attained. More wonderful still, the tendrils of the gourd had been trained about his door, and kneeling down he saw that the earth had been loosened between the rows of sprouting vegetables, and that every leaf sparkled with drops as though the rain had but newly ceased. Then it appeared to the hermit that he beheld a miracle, but doubting his own deserts he refused to believe himself worthy of such grace, and went within doors to ponder on what had befallen him, and on his bed of rushes he saw a young woman sleeping, clad in an outlandish garment with strange amulets about her neck. The sight was very terrifying to the hermit, for he recalled how often the demon, in tempting the desert fathers, had taken the form of a woman for their undoing, but he reflected that, since there was nothing pleasing to him in the sight of this female, who was brown as a nut and lean with wayfaring, he ran no great danger in looking at her. At first he took her for a wandering Egyptian, but as he looked, he perceived among the heathen charms an Agnes D. I. in her bosom, and this so surprised him that he bent over and called on her to wake. She sprang up with a start, but seeing the hermit's gown and staff and his face above her, lay quiet and said to him, I have watered your garden daily in return for the beans and oil that I took from your store. Who are you and how do you come here? asked the hermit. She said, I am a wild woman and live in the woods. And when he pressed her again to tell him why she had sought shelter in his cave, she said that the land to the south, whence she came, was full of armed companies and bands of marauders, and that great license and bloodshed prevailed there. And this the hermit knew to be true, for he had heard of it on his homeward journey. The wild woman went on to tell him that she had been hunted through the woods like an animal by a band of drunken men-at-arms, lansknechts from the north by their barbarous dress and speech, and at length, starving and spent, had come on his cave and hidden herself from her pursuers. For, she said, I fear neither wild beasts nor the woodland people, charcoal burners, Egyptians, wandering minstrels or chapmen. Even the highway robbers do not touch me, because I am poor and brown. But these armed men flown with blood and wine are more terrible than wolves and tigers. And the hermit's heart melted, for he thought of his little sister lying with her throat slit across the altar steps, and of the scenes of blood and rapine from which he had fled away into the wilderness. So he said to the stranger that it was not meat, he should house her in his cave, but that he would send a messenger to the town across the valley and beg a pious woman there to give her lodging and work in her household. For, said he, I perceive by the blessed image about your neck that you are not a heathen wilding, but a child of Christ, though so far astray from him in the desert. Yes, she said, I am a Christian and know as many prayers as you but I will never set foot in city walls again, lest I be caught and put back into the convent. What? cried the hermit with a start. You are a runagate nun. And he crossed himself, and again thought of the demon. She smiled and said, It is true I was once a cloistered woman, but I will never willingly be one again. Now drive me forth if you like, but I cannot go far, for I have a wounded foot, which I got in climbing the cliff with water for your garden. And she pointed to a deep cut in her foot. At that, for all his fear, the hermit was moved to pity and washed the cut and bound it up. And as he did so, he bethought him that perhaps his strange visitor had been sent to him, not for his soul's undoing, but for her own salvation. And from that hour, he earnestly yearned to save her but it was not fitting that she should remain in his cave. So, having given her water to drink and a handful of lentils, he raised her up and, putting his staff in her hand, guided her to a hollow not far off in the face of the cliff. And while he was doing this, he heard the sunset bells ring across the valley and set about reciting the Angelus Domini Nuntiavit 
Marii, and she joined in very piously with her hands folded, not missing a word. Nevertheless, the thought of her wickedness weighed on him, and the next day when he went to carry her food, he asked her to tell him how it came about that she had fallen into such abominable sin. And this is the story she told. Four. I was born, said she, in the north country where the winters are long and cold, where snow sometimes falls in the valleys, and the high mountains for months are white with it. My father's castle is in a tall green wood, where the winds always rustle, and a cold river runs down from the ice gorges. South of us was the wide plain, glowing with heat, but above us were stony passes, where the eagle nests and the storms howl. In winter, great fires roared in our chimneys, and even in summer there was always a cool air off the gorges. But when I was a child, my mother went southward in the great empress's train, and I went with her. We travelled many days, across plains and mountains, and saw Rome, where the Pope lives in a golden palace, and many other cities, till we came to the great emperor's court. There, for two years or more, we lived in pomp and merriment, for it was a wonderful court, full of mimes, magicians, philosophers and poets. And the Empress's ladies spent their days in mirth and music, dressed in light silken garments, walking in gardens of roses and bathing in a great cool marble tank, while the Emperor's eunuchs guarded the approach to the gardens. Oh, those baths in the marble tank, my father! I used to lie awake through the whole hot southern night and think of that plunge at sunrise under the last stars, for we were in a burning country, and I pined for the tall green woods and the cold stream of my father's valley. And when I had cooled my limbs in the tank and I lay all day in the scant cypress shade and dreamed of my next bath, my mother pined for the coolness till she died. Then the empress put me in a convent and I was forgotten. The convent was on the side of a bare yellow hill where bees made a hot buzzing in the thyme. Below was the sea blazing with a million shafts of light and overhead a blinding sky which reflected the sun's glitter like a huge baldric of steel. Now the convent was built on the site of an old pleasure house which a holy princess had given to our order and a part of the house was left standing with its court and s and in garden. The nuns had built all about the garden, but they left the cypresses in the middle and the long marble tank where the princess and her ladies had bathed. The tank, however, as you may conceive, was no longer used as a bath, for the washing of the body is an indulgence forbidden to cloistered virgins. And our abbess, who was famed for her austerities, boasted that, like Holy Sylvia the nun, she never touched water save to bathe her fingertips before receiving the sacrament. With such an example before them, the nuns were obliged to conform to the same pious rule, and many, having been bred in the convent from infancy, regarded all ablutions with horror and felt no temptation to cleanse the filth from their flesh. But I, who had bathed daily, had the freshness of clear water in my veins, and perish slowly for want of it. Like your garden herbs in a drought, my cell did not look on the garden, but on the steep mule path leading up the cliff, where all day long the sun beat as if with flails of fire, and I saw the sweating peasants toil up and down behind their thirsty asses, and the beggars whining and scraping their sores in the heat. Oh, how I hated to look out through the bars on that burning world, I used to turn away from it, sick with disgust, and lying on my hard bed, stare up by the hour at the ceiling of my cell. But flies crawled in hundreds on the ceiling, and the hot noise they made was worse than the glare. Sometimes, at an hour when I knew myself unobserved, I tore off my stifling gown and hung it over the grated window that I might no longer see the shaft of hot sunlight lying across my cell and the dust dancing in it like fat in the fire. But the darkness choked me, and I struggled for breath as though I lay at the bottom of a pit, so that at last I would spring up and, dragging down the dress, fling myself on my knees before the cross 
and entreat our Lord to give me the gift of holiness, that I might escape the everlasting fires of hell, of which this heat was like an awful foretaste. For if I could not endure the scorching of a summer's day, with what constancy could I meet the thought of the flame that dieth not? This longing to escape the heat of hell made me apply myself to a devouter way of living, and I reflected that if my bodily distress was somewhat eased, I should be able to throw myself with greater zeal into the practice of vigils and austerities. And at length, having set forth to the abbess that the sultry air of my cell induced in me a grievous heaviness of sleep, I prevailed on her to lodge me in that part of the building which overlooked the garden. For a few days I was quite happy, for instead of the dusty mountainside and the sight of the sweating peasants and their asses, I looked out on dark cypresses and rows of budding vegetables. But presently I found I had not bettered myself, for with the approach of midsummer the garden, being all enclosed with buildings, grew as stifling as my cell. All the green things in it withered and dried off, leaving trenches of bare red earth, across which the cypresses cast strips of shade too narrow to cool the aching heads of the nuns who sought shelter there. And I began to think sorrowfully of my former cell, where now and then there came a sea breeze, hot and languid, yet alive, and where at least I could look out upon the sea. But this was not the worst, for when the dog days came, I found that the sun, at a certain hour, cast on the ceiling of my cell the reflection of the ripples on the garden tank, and to say how I suffered from this sight is not within the power of speech. It was indeed agony to watch the clear water rippling and washing above my head, yet feel no solace of it on my limbs, as though I had been a senseless brazen image lying at the bottom of a well. But the image, if it felt no refreshment, would have suffered no torture, whereas every inch of my skin throbbed with thirst, and every vein was a mouth of dives praying for a drop of water. O oh, Father, how shall I tell you the grievous pains that I endured? Sometimes I so feared the sight of the mocking ripples overhead that I hid my eyes from their approach, lying face down on my burning bed, till I knew that they were gone. Yet on cloudy days, when they did not come, the heat was even worse to bear. By day I hardly dared trust myself in the garden, for the nuns walked there, and one fiery noon they found me hanging so close above the tank that they snatched me away, crying out that I had tried to destroy myself. The scandal of this reaching the abbess, she sent for me to know what demon had beset me, and when I wept and said, the longing to bathe my burning body, she broke into great anger and cried out, do you not know that this is a sin well nigh as great as the other and condemned by all the greatest saints? For a nun may be tempted to take her life through excess of self-scrutiny and despair of her own worthiness, but this desire to indulge the despicable body is one of the lusts of the flesh, to be classed with concupiscence and adultery. And she ordered me to sleep every night for a month in my heavy gown, with a veil upon my face. Now, Father, I believe it was this penance that drove me to sin, for we were in the dog days, and it was more than flesh could bear. And on the third night, after the portress had passed, and the lights were out, I rose and flung off my veil and gown and knelt in my window, fainting. There was no moon, but the sky was full of stars. At first the garden was all blackness, but as I looked, I saw a faint twinkle between the cypress trunks, and I knew it was the starlight on the tank. The water! The water! It was there close to me. Only a few bolts and bars were between us. The portress was a heavy sleeper, and I knew where her keys hung, on a nail just within the door of her cell. I stole thither, unlatched the door, seized the keys, and crept barefoot down the corridor. The bolts of the cloister door were stiff and heavy, and I dragged at them till the veins in my wrists were bursting. Then I turned the key and it cried out in the ward. I stood still, my whole body beating with fear lest the hinges too should have a voice. But no one stirred, and I pushed open the door and slipped out. <laughs>
The garden was as airless as a pit, but at least I could stretch my arms in it. And, oh, my father, the sweetness of the stars. The stones in the path cut my feet as I ran, but I thought of the joy of bathing them in the tank, and that made the wounds sweet to me. My father, I have heard of the temptations which in times past assailed the holy solitaries of the desert, flattering the reluctant flesh beyond resistance. But none, I think, could have surpassed in ecstasy that first touch of the water on my limbs. To prolong the joy, I let myself slip in slowly, resting my hands on the edge of the tank and smiling to see my body as I lowered it break up the shining black surface and shatter the star beams into splinters. And the water my father seemed to crave me as I craved it. Its ripples rose about me, first in furtive touches, then in a long embrace that clung and drew me down, till at length they lay like kisses on my lips. It was no frank comrade like the mountain pools of my childhood, but a secret playmate, compassionating my pains and soothing them with noiseless hands. From the first, I thought of it as an accomplice. Its whisper seemed to promise me secrecy if I would promise it love. And I went back and back to it, my father. All day I lived in the thought of it. Each night I stole to it with fresh thirst. But at length the old portress died and a young lay sister took her place. She was a light sleeper and keen-eared, and I knew the danger of venturing to her cell. I knew the danger, but when darkness came, I felt the water drawing me. The first night I fought on my bed and held out, but the second I crept to her door. She made no motion when I entered, but rose up secretly and stole after me. And the second night she warned the abbess, and the two came on me as I stood by the tank. I was punished with terrible penances fasting, scourging, imprisonment, and the privation of drinking water. For the abbess stood amazed at the obduracy of my sin and was resolved to make me an example to my fellows. For a month I endured the pains of hell. Then one night the Saracen pirates fell on our convent. On a sudden the darkness was full of flames and blood, but while the other nuns ran hither and thither, clinging to the abbess's feet or shrieking on the steps of the altar, I slipped through an unwatched postern and made my way to the hills. The next day the emperor's soldiery descended on the carousing heathen, slew them and burned their vessels on the beach. The abbess and nuns were rescued, the convent walls rebuilt and peace restored to the holy precincts. All this I heard from a shepherdess of the hills who found me in my hiding and brought me honeycomb and water. In her simplicity, she offered to lead me home to the convent. But while she slept, I laid off my wimple and scapula, and stealing her cloak, fled away lest she should betray me. And since then, I have wandered alone over the face of the world, living in woods and desert places, often hungry, often cold, and sometimes fearful. Yet resigned to any hardship and with a front for any peril, if only I may sleep under the free heaven and wash the dust from my body in cool water. 5. The hermit, as may be supposed, was much perturbed by this story and dismayed that such sinfulness should cross his path. His first motion was to drive the woman forth, for he knew the heinousness of the craving for water and how St. Jerome, St. Augustine and other holy doctors have taught that they who would purify the soul must not be distraught by the vain cares of bodily cleanliness. Yet remembering the lust that drew him to his lords, he dared not judge his sister's fault too harshly. Moreover, he was moved by the wild woman's story of the hardships she had suffered and the godless company she had been driven to keep, Egyptians, jugglers, outlaws, and even sorcerers who are masters of the pagan law of the East and still practice their dark rites among the simple folk of the hills. Yet she would not have him think wholly ill of this vagrant people from whom she had often received food and comfort, and her worst danger, as he learned with shame, had come from the Jiravaki or wandering monks, 
who are the scourge and dishonour of Christendom, carrying their ribald idleness from one monastery to another and leaving on their way a trail of thieving revelry and worse. Once or twice the wild woman had nearly fallen into their hands, but had been saved by her own quick wit and skill in woodcraft. Once, so she assured the hermit, she had found refuge with a fawn and his female, who fed and sheltered her in their cave, where she slept on a bed of leaves with their shaggy nurslings, and in this cave she had seen a stock or idol of wood extremely seamed and ancient, before which the wood creatures, when they thought she slept, laid garlands and the wild bees' honeycomb. She told him also of a hill village of weavers, where she lived many weeks, and learned to ply their trade in return for her lodging, and where wayfaring men in the guise of cobblers, charcoal burners or goat herds came and taught strange doctrines at midnight in the poor hovels. What they taught she could not clearly tell, save that they believed each soul could commune directly with its maker, without need of priest or intercessor. Also she had heard from some of their disciples that there are two gods, one of good and one of evil and that the god of evil has his throne in the Pope's palace in Rome. But in spite of these dark teachings, they were a mild and merciful folk, full of loving kindness toward poor persons and wayfarers, so that her heart grieved for them when one day a Dominican monk appeared in the village with a company of soldiers, and some of the weavers were seized and dragged to prison, while others, with their wives and babes, fled to the winter woods. She fled with them, fearing to be charged with their heresy, and for months they lay hid in desert places, the older and weaker, who fell sick from want and exposure, being devoutly ministered to by their brethren, and dying in the sure faith of heaven. All this she related modestly and simply, not as one who joys in a godless life, but as having been drawn into it through misadventure, and she told the hermit that when she heard the sound of church bells, she never failed to say an ave or a pater, and that often, as she lay in the midnight darkness of the forest, she had hushed her fears by reciting the versicles from the evening hour. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of the eye. Protect us under the shadow of thy wings. The wound in her foot healed slowly, and the hermit, while it was mending, repaired daily to her cave, reasoning with her in love and charity, and exhorting her to return to the cloister. But this she persistently refused to do, and, fearing lest she attempt to fly before her foot was healed, and so expose herself to hunger and ill usage, he promised not to betray her presence, or to take any measures toward restoring her to her order. He began indeed to doubt whether she had any calling to the life enclosed, yet her gentleness and innocency of mind made him feel that she might be won back to holy living, if only her freedom were assured. So after many inward struggles, since his promise forbade his taking counsel with any concerning her, he resolved to let her remain in the cave till some light should come to him. And one day, visiting her about the hour of nones, for it became his pious habit to say the evening office with her, he found her engaged with a little goat herd, who in a sudden seizure had fallen from a rock above her cave and lay senseless and full of blood at her feet. And the hermit saw with wonder how skillfully she bound up his cuts and restored his senses, giving him to drink of a liquor she had distilled from the wild simples of the mountain, whereat the boy opened his eyes and praised God as one restored by heaven. Now it was known that this lad was subject to possessions, and had more than once dropped lifeless while he heeded his flock. And the hermit, knowing that only great saints or unclean necromancers can loosen devils, feared that the wild woman had exorcised the spirits by means of unholy spells. But she told him that the goat herd's sickness was caused only by the heat of the sun, and that, such seizures being common in the hot countries whence she came, she had learned from a wise woman how to stay them by a decoction of the Carduus Benedictus, made in the third night of the waxing moon, but without the aid of magic. But, she continued, you need not fear my bringing scandal on your holy retreat, for by the arts of the same wise woman, 
my own wound is well nigh healed, and tonight, at sunset, I set forth on my travels. The hermit's heart grew heavy as she spoke, and it seemed to him that her own look was sorrowful, and suddenly his perplexities were lifted from him and he saw what was God's purpose with the wild woman. Why, said he, do you fly from this place where you are safe from molestation and can look to the saving of your soul? Is it that your feet weary for the road and your spirits are heavy for lack of worldly discourse? She replied that she had no wish to travel and felt no repugnance to solitude. But, said she, I must go forth to beg my bread, since in this wilderness there is none but yourself to feed me. And moreover, when it is known that I have healed the goat herd, curious folk and scandalmongers may seek me out and, learning whence I come, drag me back to the cloister. Then the hermit answered her and said, In the early days, when the faith of Christ was first preached, there were holy women who fled to the desert and lived there in solitude to the glory of God and the edification of their sex. If you are minded to embrace so austere a life, contenting you with such sustenance as the wilderness yields and wearing out your days in prayer and vigil, it may be that you shall make amends for the great sin you have committed and live and die in the peace of the Lord Jesus. He spoke thus, knowing that if she left him and returned to her roaming, hunger and fear might drive her to fresh sin, whereas in a life of penance and reclusion, her eyes might be open to her iniquity and her soul snatched back from ruin. He saw that his words moved her, and she seemed about to consent and embrace a life of holiness. But suddenly she fell silent and looked down on the valley at their feet. A stream flows in the glen below us, she said. Do you forbid me to bathe in it in the heat of summer? It is not I that forbid you, my daughter, but the laws of God, said the hermit. Yet see how miraculously heaven protects you. For in the hot season, when your lust is upon you, our stream runs dry and temptation will be removed from you. Moreover, on these heights there is no excess of heat to madden the body, but always, before dawn and at the Angelus, a cool breeze which refreshes it like water. And after thinking long on this and again, receiving his promise not to betray her, the wild woman agreed to embrace a life of reclusion, and the hermit fell on his knees, worshipping God and rejoicing to think that, if he saved his sister from sin, his own term of probation would be shortened. 6. Thereafter, for two years, the hermit and the wild woman lived side by side, meeting together to pray on the great feast days of the year, but on all other days dwelling apart engaged in pious practices. At first, the hermit, knowing the weakness of woman and her little aptitude for the life apart, had feared that he might be disturbed by the nearness of his penitent but she faithfully held to his commands, abstaining from all sight of him save on the days of obligation. And when they met, so modest and devout was her demeanour that she raised his soul to fresh fervency. And gradually it grew sweet to him to think that, nearby though unseen, was one who performed the same tasks at the same hours, so that whether he tended his garden or recited his chaplet or rose under the stars to repeat the midnight office, He had a companion in all his labours and devotions. Meanwhile, the report had spread abroad that a holy woman who cast out devils had made her dwelling in the hermit's cliff, and many sick persons from the valley sought her out and went away restored by her. These poor pilgrims brought her oil and flour, and with her own hands she made a garden like the hermit's and planted it with corn and lentils but she would never take a trout from the brook or receive the gift of a snared wildfowl, for she said that in her vagrant life the wild creatures of the wood had befriended her, and as she had slept in peace among them, so now she would never suffer them to be molested. In the third year came a plague, and death 
walked the cities, and many poor peasants fled to the hills to escape it. These the hermit and his penitent faithfully tended, and so skilful were the wild woman's ministrations that the report of them reached the town across the valley, and a deputation of burgesses came with rich offerings and besought her to descend and comfort their sick. The hermit, seeing her depart on so dangerous a mission, would have accompanied her, but she bade him remain and tend those who fled to the hills, and for many days his heart was consumed in prayer for her, and he feared lest every fugitive should bring him word of her death. But at length she returned, wearied out but whole, and covered with the blessings of the townsfolk, and thereafter her name for holiness spread as wide as the hermit's. Seeing how constant she remained in her chosen life and what advance she had made in the way of perfection, the hermit now felt that it behooved him to exhort her again to return to the convent, and more than once he resolved to speak with her but his heart hung back. At length he bethought him that by failing in this duty he imperiled his own soul, and thereupon, on the next feast day when they met, he reminded her that in spite of her good works, she still lived in sin and excommunicate, and that, now she had once more tasted the sweets of godliness, it was her duty to confess her fault and give herself up to her superiors. She heard him meekly, but when he had spoken she was silent and her tears ran over, and looking at her he wept also and said no more. And they prayed together, and returned each to his cave. It was not till late winter that the plague abated, and the spring and early summer following were heavy with rains and great heat. When the hermit visited his penitent at the Feast of Pentecost, she appeared to him so weak and wasted that, when they had recited the Veni, Sancta Spiritus, and the proper Psalms, he taxed her with too great rigour of penitential practices but she replied that her weakness was not due to an excess of discipline, but that she had brought back from her labours among the sick a heaviness of body which the intemperance of the season no doubt increased. The evil rains continued, falling chiefly at night, while by day the land reeked with heat and vapours, so that lassitude fell on the hermit also, and he could hardly drag himself down to the spring whence he drew his drinking water. Thus he fell into the habit of going down to the glen before cockcrow, after he had recited matins, for at that hour the rain commonly ceased and a faint air was stirring. Now because of the wet season the stream had not gone dry, and instead of replenishing his flagon slowly at the trickling spring, the hermit went down to the waterside to fill it. And once, as he descended the steep slope of the glen, he heard the covert rustle, and saw the leaves stir as though something moved behind them. As he looked, silence fell, and the leaves grew still, but his heart was shaken, for it seemed to him that what he had seen in the dusk had a human semblance, such as the wood people wear, and he was loath to think that such unhallowed beings haunted the glen. A few days passed, and again descending to the stream, he saw a figure flit by him through the covert and this time a deeper fear entered into him, but he put away the thought and prayed fervently for all souls in temptation. And when he spoke with the wild woman again, on the feast of the seven Maccabees, which falls on the first day of August, he was smitten with fear to see her wasted looks and besought her to cease from labouring and let him minister to her in her weakness. But she denied him gently and replied that all she asked of him was to keep her steadfastly in his prayers. Before the Feast of the Assumption the rains ceased, and the plague which had begun to show itself was stayed. But the ardency of the sun grew greater, and the hermit's cliff was a fiery furnace. Never had such heat been known in those regions, but the people did not murmur, for with the cessation of the rain their crops were saved and the pestilence banished and these mercies they ascribed in great part to the prayers and macerations of the two holy anchorets. Therefore, on the eve of the Assumption, they sent a messenger to the hermit, saying that at daylight on the morrow, the townspeople and all the dwellers in the valley would come forth, led by their bishop, 
who bore the Pope's blessing to the two solitaries and who was mindful to celebrate the mass of the Assumption in the Hermit's Cave in the cliffside. At the blessed word, the Hermit was well nigh distraught with joy, for he felt this to be a sign from heaven that his prayers were heard and that he had won the wild woman's grace as well as his own. And all night he prayed that on the morrow she might confess her fault and receive the sacrament with him. Before dawn he recited the psalms of the proper nocturne. Then he girded on his gown and sandals and went forth to meet the bishop in the valley. As he went downward, daylight stood on the mountains, and he thought he had never seen so fair a dawn. It filled the farthest heaven with brightness and penetrated even to the woody crevices of the glen, as the grace of God had entered into the obscurest folds of his heart. The morning airs were hushed, and he heard only the sound of his own footfall and the murmur of the stream which, though diminished, still poured a swift current between the rocks. But as he reached the bottom of the glen, a sound of chanting came to him, and he knew that the pilgrims were at hand. His heart leapt up and his feet hastened forward, but at the stream side they were suddenly stayed, for in a pool where the water was still deep, he saw the shining of a woman's body, and on a stone hard by lay the wild woman's gown and sandals. Fear and rage possessed the hermit's heart, and he stood as one smitten speechless, covering his eyes from the shame. But the song of the approaching pilgrims swelled ever louder and nearer, and, finding voice, he cried to the wild woman to come forth and hide herself from the people. She made no answer, but in the dusk he saw her limbs sway with the swaying of the water, and her eyes were turned to him as if in mockery. At the sight, blind fury filled him, and clambering over the rocks to the pool's edge, he bent down and caught her by the shoulder. At that moment, he could have strangled her with his hands, so abhorrent to him was the touch of her flesh. But as he cried out on her, heaping her with cruel names, he saw that her eyes returned his look without wavering. And suddenly it came to him that she was dead. Then through all his anger and fear, a great pang smote him, for here was his work undone, and one he had loved in Christ laid low in her sin, in spite of all his labours. One moment pity possessed him, the next he bethought him how the people would find him bending above the body of a naked woman, whom he had held up to them as holy, but whom they might now well take for the secret instrument of his undoing. And beholding how at her touch all the slow edifice of his holiness was demolished, and his soul in mortal jeopardy, he felt the earth reel round him, and his sight grew red. Already the head of the procession had entered the glen, and the stillness shook with the great sound of the Salve Regina. When the hermit opened his eyes once more, the air was quivering with thronged candle flames, which glittered on the gold thread of priestly vestments, and on the blazing monstrance beneath its canopy and close above him was bent the bishop's face. But the hermit struggled to his knees. My father in God, he cried, behold, for my sins I have been visited by a demon. But as he spoke, he perceived that those about him no longer heeded him, and that the bishop and all his clergy had fallen on their knees about the pool. Then the hermit, following their gaze, saw that the brown waters of the pool covered the wild woman's limbs as with a garment, and that about her floating head a great light floated, and to the utmost edges of the throng a cry of praise went up, for many were there whom the wild woman had healed and comforted, and who read God's mercy in this wonder. But fresh fear fell on the hermit, for he had cursed a dying saint, and denounced her aloud to all the people. And this new anguish, coming so close upon the other, smote down his weakened frame, so that his limbs failed him, and he sank once more to the ground. Again the earth reeled about him, and the bending faces grew remote, but as he forced his weak voice once more to proclaim his sins, he felt the blessed touch of absolution, and the holy oils of the last voyage laid on his lips and eyes.
Peace returned to him then, and with it a great longing to look once more upon his lords, as he had dreamed of doing at his last hour, but he was too far gone to make this longing known, and so tried to banish it from his mind. Yet in his weakness the wish held him, and the tears ran down his face. Then, as he lay there, feeling the earth slip from under him, and the everlasting arms replace it, he heard a great peal of voices that seemed to come down from the sky and mingle with the singing of the throng, and the words of the chant were the words of his own lords, so long hidden in the secret of his breast and now rejoicing above him through the spheres. And his soul rose on the chant and soared with it to the seat of mercy.